us today. And uh, we would like for you, if you are in uh, li- with us virtually, to tell us where you're viewing from. We'd love to know that location if you want to share. And we want, want to also welcome those that are in person at the Fayette County Extension Office. So today at Job Club, our agenda, we will have a fabulous speaker, which we will shortly introduce to you. We're also going to hear from our success stories. We have a couple of those that we're very excited about. Then we're going to have our main speaker presentations. We will, after that, we'll share some facilitator notes and news. And we're going to give you some partner updates along with the next Job Club topic. Our mission is to provide a positive environment for job seekers to learn best practices for their job search. And we meet the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. And you can find the schedule of topics at www.ukalumni.net slash job club. I want to introduce you to our job team, job club team. I'm Diana Doggett, and I am the extension specialist for special projects. We have Caroline Francis, and she is the director of alumni career services. Amy Grant Gablin also joins her as the associate director of alumni career services. We have Nicole Waite, and she is with employment Uh, She is an employment specialist with UK Steps and behind the scenes and just fulfilling so many wonderful functions is Suzanne Smith and Sonny Saylor here at the Fayette County Cooperative Extension, as well as Queen Sullivan, Christy Kaufman and Lindsay Cotto uh, with the UK Alumni Association. So thanks to our awesome team for uh, helping and supporting us today. We do encourage you to come in person. Um, That's usually always the best option because you get individual attention and um, we just pride ourselves on being able to stay afterwards and and network. But online is also a great opportunity uh, through Zoom webinar or Facebook Live. So those are are currently options for you and uh, we're excited that you could uh, have those. A chat moderator is available for for the uh, webinar, and uh, we have view only for Facebook Live. You can receive our free Job Club newsletter packet uh, from our website. So you just can go and it's linked there. And we do want you to check that out. It has a wonderful resources for your job search and it is available. Uh, if you come in person, we'll, we'll provide one of those to you, but it's also uh, linked to our, our website. We want to encourage you to also join the Job Club of Kentucky Sharing Community LinkedIn site. And that's an opportunity for you to stay connected do, during the two-week interim that we're not meeting. And we often post new job leads there as well as beneficial resources and articles. We always welcome employers and recruiters to Job Club. Uh, We love for you to tell your your job leads firsthand. If you're in our audience today, just raise your hand at the conclusion of our session and we'll give you a one minute opportunity to share that job lead. Uh, Watch for your email newsletter later today, and they, it will include job leads that have been sent and shared with our job club team. We're always mindful that some people are conducting a confidential job search. So we want to be respectful of their privacy. And that means that uh, we will always regard that during our, our uh, not only in, in-house, but virtual attendance. One of the big um, questions that's always asked is, do we record our sessions? And yes, we do. So they are also on our uh, Jobs Club website. And you can look at our archive and 
select your topic of interest or need, and there will be a previous session that has been recorded and placed in that archive. We want to welcome our first timers today. I think we have a few in our audience. So just raise your hand if you're first time. Yay, so let's welcome them. And if you're first time online, please let us know that. Let us welcome you as well. Um, again, you're going to receive a follow-up survey later on today. It's about six questions and it will get you into our notification system so that you will be notified of each and every session um, ongoing as well as some other information when we, um, we have opportunities to share that. So please fill that out for us. Uh, you can scan the QR code on your screen or, um, and those of you that are in session, we have your registration already. So we're excited to get, have you join our our team. So now it's time for success stories. And as I indicated, we have a couple. And I think the uniqueness of this is that we have not only an in-house of, of, of attendees that actually came in person, we have that success story, as well as a virtual attendee success story. So it says you can you can get jobs both ways because you are following best practices for the job search that's being presented by Job Club. Um, so we'll begin with the first one. Um, this was a, a virtual attendee and uh, it's hello. I wanted to let you know that I started a new job today at Tyson Foods in Bowling Green, Kentucky. The resources that you provided with regard to resume improvement and interview skills greatly helped me get the job. Thank you, Chastity Phelps from Bowling Green, Kentucky. We are just thrilled about that. And we're also very appreciative that she reached out to us and told us about that success story because um, that helps us, that motivates us, it validates job clubs. So we just appreciate it when you uh, take the time to, to let us know about your job club success. Our second one is from an in-person attendee, and it goes like this. About a month ago, my new job was posted at a UK job club meeting. So we actually, we announced that, that job lead here in, in session. Over the past six years, a family event deterred me from conducting my job search, and as of today, my new era of employment has begun. My new job is actually a continuation of my first job that I started immediately after I graduated from college. There is always hope for you to find another job or to return to the job market. There the, job, the UK Job Club is available to support and inspire you. Whatever you do, please do not ever give up. Remember to believe in yourself and ask for help and direction from the staff of the UK Job Club. Show, show passion and creativity as you conduct your search and do not take no for the final answer. Don't give up. Do not ever give up. Thanks again for all your assistance. Sincerely, Randall Lohman. So we are thrilled for Randall. Uh, he, he did persevere. Uh, I can't tell you, he, he was determined to get that interview and he got it and he got the job. So that is truly, uh, truly a success. You know, we also deem other successes as um, the process. So if you had an interview, if you updated your resume, maybe you um, um, reached out to someone, you expanded your network, those are all successes that we hope that you are regarding as such. And know that this is uh, a journey and it's one that we hope we are helping you with step-by-step uh, -step with what it takes to get to that final destination. And we uh, sincerely um, will be celebrating with you when you share that you've reached your, your goal as well. Well, this is an honor for me today to introduce our speaker. 
Um, she's representing my employer, the Cooperative Extension Service. And uh, so I'm excited that she's gonna be able to share about not only um, the, the job search process, but also opportunities within Extension. Stacy Miller serves as the Associate General Counsel to the University and the Director of Extension Human Resources. In private practice, she served 13 years with Stoll, Keenan, and Ogden where she was a member of the firm's labor, employment, and em employment benefits, employee benefits. As director of Extension Human Resources, Ms. Miller oversees recruitment, hiring, and onboarding for UK Cooperative Extension's more than 120 offices. Ms. Miller is a graduate of the UK College of Law, where she was a member of the Kentucky Law Journal, she earned her master's degree from UK's Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce and a bachelor's degree in French from UK. So she has a very, uh, very varied um, background. And Stacy, we couldn't just be more excited to have you join us. We're part of UK. You're part of the UK. So welcome to Job Club. Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. I am going to turn off my video. I am in Ag North on campus um, today, and we're having a little trouble with our internet, so I don't want to distract you with some kind of crazy frozen freeze frame. Um, so I'm going to turn that off real quick, and then I'll turn it back on um, at the end in the Q&A. But I'm really excited to be here with you all today, um, and I'm really excited to talk about this is a topic that, of course, I work very closely on. I see a lot of things. Some of them are fantastic, some of them are less fantastic, and you guys are going to benefit from the, um, you know, from what I have experienced during these interviews sitting at the other side of the table. So um, we're just going to take it step by step this morning. All right. Okay. All right, so this morning we are going to be discussing best practices in finding and applying for positions. We're going to talk about resume writing and we are going to talk about interviewing as well. Um, and as was mentioned, we are going to talk a little bit about the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service and our career and internship opportunities and how you all might tap into those. We have a lot of opportunities right now. So the first question typically um, uh, a job seeker has is, where do I find a job? So I want to start there this morning. As you begin your job hunt, um, what I would suggest is that you reach out to, um, to colleagues, to people that you know. If you're a little closer to your college experience, maybe your advisors or college mentors, um, and just talk about your interests and your career options. And we have alumni services and career services. You know, Sit down and speak with one of those advisors and talk about um, where you have a college degree, what types of jobs might fit that degree? Um, what types of position titles should I be searching for on the job sites? Um, I always come back to you, my minor in um, undergraduate was communications. But if you just type communications into LinkedIn, it's going to pull up um, like, lineman jobs, you know, for at and you know, so it's, it, it, that's not a word that translated well into the kind of jobs that I was looking for. So I think it is important to sit down and speak with somebody who has some experience, particularly in the field that you're looking to get into. What are the job titles I should be searching for on the job websites? And then ask your contacts if they have any leads or resources or connections that they might be willing to share with you. I think those kinds of conversations with your advisors, with your colleagues, um, with career services at UK or alumni services or professors, if you're still close to them, can really help you focus your search more constructively. I would also suggest that you just think about what you might like to do and apply broadly. At, um, as was mentioned, I practiced employment law for almost 15 years in private practice. And in that role, I have looked at just about a million job applications and um, personnel files. 
um, just during litigation and document review. And I think you would be surprised to learn. I know I was earlier in my career surprised to learn how many companies just want you to have a degree, any degree. Um, they don't necessarily care what your degree is in. So I think definitely cast a very wide net when you're applying. Um, but I do want to add just one word of caution. I would manage your expectations a little bit, especially if you are a more recent graduate. Um, your degree, for example, might be in management. But if you're a fairly recent graduate, I think you, you might not expect to, to be hired directly um, into your first job as a manager right out of college. I think what you can expect is that you'll need to start lower on the career ladder, lower in the organization, learn that business, and then work your way up as you gain that institutional knowledge and experience. You will also want to be very, very judicious about your use of social media during any season of life in which you're actively seeking a new job. So now this survey has a little bit of age on it, but CareerBuilder did a survey in 2018 that revealed that the number of hiring managers who were using social media to investigate job applicants has grown enormously over the last several years. Their survey specifically concluded that 70% of employers were turning to social networks to research job applicants. Mm -hmm. And some surveys that I have read have shown even higher percentages of employers who are screening their job applicants through their personal social media accounts. So really consider looking at your social media accounts. Think about your privacy settings. Uh, but also take a look at your content if, if it is publicly viewable and think about whether that content is consistent with the image that you want to portray to a potential employer. 40% um, of the employers that were surveyed um, said that they had declined to hire someone who had posted what they considered inappropriate photographs or videos or information. So, you know, think about those vacation pictures or the other things that you have up there. Maybe those are more appropriate for people that you know personally. Maybe we need to lock that down in terms of what is publicly viewable to non-friends or non-followers. Um, but you might also actually be surprised to find that there are other things that are equally big turnoffs for employers. Um, for example, a 2014 survey that was done by Money Man Magazine found that 66% of the hiring managers surveyed said that they would hold poor spelling and grammar against the candidates. Now, this is not your resume or your application that we are talking about. Hopefully you have spell checked those aggressively. These hiring managers are making that decision and that assessment based on your grammar and your spelling from your personal social media pages. So really take a look at that digital footprint and make sure that it won't be a deterrent to a successful job hunt. Before talking to you all today, I actually mentioned to two colleagues who are also both HR managers in private industry that I was going to be talking to you all about job hunting and hiring. And it's funny, both of those individuals, independently of one another, and immediately upon hearing what I was going to be talking to you all about said two things. The first was use a respectable email address. And the other was to use a professional voicemail greeting. Your email address should be your name, you know, Stacy Miller at gmail.com or whatever it is, not I'm a cat lady at yahoo.com. Now I'm sorry to I'm a cat lady. I have not checked to see if that's a real email address. Don't anybody email I'm a cat lady. Um, but I do certainly see some really interesting email addresses on resumes, you know, that are just a personal email address. And um, it stands out when everything else looks so professional to have some kind of unprofessional email address really does stand out glaringly um, on a resume or an application. Um, now, if you have created a special email address, a more professional looking handle for your email for the purposes of job seeking, 
definitely make sure that you are frequently checking that email account if you're using it on those job applications and resumes. We had one um, applicant who had done just that, who had created a professional email address, a separate email account for job seeking, but then never checked it. And we could not get them to respond to any of our requests to come in an interview to the point where the committee grew weary of trying. So make sure that you are um, checking that email address regularly if you have used it and you have actively sent out applications. Your voicemail greeting also should be professional and it should give the impression that you are responsive and responsible. So not something like, don't leave me, leave me a voicemail, I don't ever check it, send me a text instead. These are things we've gotten, right? Instead, it should be something like, this is Stacy Miller. I'm not available to take your call right now. Please leave your name, telephone number, and a brief message, and I will get back to you within the hour. And then actually do that, right? So definitely be checking all of those communications um, uh, hubs that you have listed in your application and your resume. Now I've mentioned and cautioned you about using social media and about scrubbing your social media pages before you go job hunting, but I would like to encourage you to join a professional networking site or several. Um, there are some general ones that work across all industries, LinkedIn is an example of that, and then there are some industry specific ones. I know there are ones for extension, for example. I would encourage you to explore that and then to get on there and develop your profile. When you develop your profile, at least on LinkedIn, there is a place for you to select the skills and the experience that you have, and those will appear on your profile page. Make sure when you do that, that you are correlating that to the resumes that you have been submitting for positions you're applying for, um, and that you identify as broadly as possible all of the things that you may have skills or experience in. And I say that for two reasons. One, employers are looking at professional networking sites when they research candidates. Um, but two, if the job site, if the networking site has a job search feature, it will look at your profile and it will push opportunities at you based on the things it sees in your profile. Um, so again, it's really important. You don't want to do a cookie cutter approach if you're applying for jobs. You know, everything needs to match, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. But definitely make sure that what is on the application and the resume you are submitting for a job matches the profile that you have put up on social media, on LinkedIn or whatever professional networking site you are using. Um, this is not the kind of social media that you use casually in your <laughs> in your free time. Um, so, you know, if you choose to use a picture of yourself on your professional networking page, you know, use a nice professional headshot. The examples here are very extremely different. One is sort of an Instagram, you know, filtered, you know, picture. And the other is a professional headshot. But I think less extreme and more common is, um, you know, where folks have taken a headshot of themselves, a selfie, outside by the trees or the whatever. Um, I would say that does not play as well um, in, in portraying a professional presence online as going ahead and getting a professional headshot done. I know there are um, career services at UK will offer them for students. Um, there are places around town where you can get a professional headshot taken. I think that that is a good investment and that is the picture that you would need to use on your professional networking site. You want to help them see you in this role. You don't want anything that you put up or have out there to distract from them seeing you in this role. So professional networking. Um, there's an old saying, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think there's certainly some merit to that in job hunting, um, hiring somebody and then having to spend 40 hours a week with them, which is sometimes more than you're spending with your own family, <laughs> you know, that can be a scary thing for a hiring official. Hiring somebody that you know at least a little or who is recommended to you by someone whose opinion you trust feels like a lot safer bet than hiring someone that neither you nor your colleagues have ever worked with or know. 
Um, and that's why that professional networking is so important. So really get involved in professional associations in your field. Really look for those industry relevant groups or um, you know, chamber groups, those community groups, and get involved and start making those personal connections with professionals in your field. And those professionals will be good source of information about job openings um, and internships, and they will be great references. But you do have to do it right. So when you are engaging with these professional associations or these other networking opportunities, be professional in your attire, uh, be professional in your demeanor, and I would treat all of these interactions as though they were a job interview because making a bad impression in these groups, being, being unprofessional, being too personal or inappropriate or complaining about your current job, that can have far reaching outcomes for you as well. So don't forget what your goal is. Keep your eye on the ball. So if you're in those meetings, your goal is to use those contacts to help you get to the next job. So treat it like an interview, treat all of those inter interactions like a job interview. All right, so let's talk about your resume for just a minute. What do you put on there? I mentioned it before, um, you know, you want everything to match, certainly. Um, when you're submitting a resume to an employer that is in response to a specific job advertisement, I think it's really important to use their words. I don't ever want you to lie on your application or your resume. You certainly don't do that. But if you have the experience that they're looking for, use their words to describe it. So for example, if you're applying for a job in human resources and the job description says that they want somebody with experience in onboarding, and your resume says you have experience in interviewing, hiring, and orientation, tweak your resume to say you have experience in onboarding and then list interviewing, hiring, and orientation as examples of your onboarding experience. You don't want to just use one generic cookie cutter resume for every job that you apply to. This is really a time investment on the front end, but I think it will save you a lot of time overall in the searching process to customize your resume to the job that you are looking for. So if you have the skill that you are applying to, so if you have the skills or the experience that they're looking for, you want to make sure that you are tracking as closely as possible the language that they use in their job advertisement to describe the person that they want to hire. You know, your professional um, social media profile, your networking profile um, should also use that terminology. I mentioned it before that when you do that, that skills profile, the skills need to match what you have in your resume. There can be more of them on your LinkedIn profile, but you certainly need to at least include the ones that, that you're highlighting in your resume that this, in, that this employer is specifically looking for and make sure that those appear and that those feature maybe higher up on the list. Um, <laughs> here's, a, here's a little free advice for you as well. Um, if you're going to use an objective section in your resume, make sure um, that the, you know, the job you're listing in your objective section and the job that you are referencing in your cover letter is the same job that you are applying for. I have seen people mess this up. They'll use an old resume or UK system, you know, keeps your application and your resume in there, right? And you could go in there and leave it and just continue to use that to apply for jobs. And people do that, right? But the first time they applied, they tailored it to the job they were looking for. And then they never went back and looked at it again. Um, so, you know, they've used an old resume that says they're interested in our hospital administrator position, but we're hiring an agriculture agent, you know, so the committee tossed them. They might actually have been a fit, but that lack of attention to detail says that, you know, they're not really focused on what's going on here. It's a little less professional and the committees really don't respond well to that. So make sure that everything matches, that your objective section, that your cover letter um, if those are going to specifically reference the position, make sure it is the one that you are submitting your application for. If you are um, a relatively recent graduate and you had um, intern experience, 
uh, definitely include that. I think that intern experience is really valuable. I think most employers understand if they're hiring a new graduate that that individual is not going to have a lot of job-related experience. But the applicants who have that internship experience in their field definitely do stand out from other new graduates because they have relevant real-world experience in their field. Um, and when I call and talk to those references, those recommendations do mean something more. So um, you want to make sure that your references can speak to that job knowledge and professionalism, and those internships um, provide that opening for our applicants in a way that um, other positions don't. So make sure that that's um, that's something that's in there if you've got if you've got that experience. All right. So your application do put as much effort into this as you do your resume. I see a lot of people sort of flame out and lose energy when it gets to the application process because they have put so much effort into their resume, making that perfect, that they don't fill out the application all the way, or they just, they don't put as much care into the descriptions of their work. Um, and I will tell you, some committee members are application people and some of them are resume people, right? And some of them look at everything. So no matter what they're looking at, you need to be conveying the same information, <clears throat> excuse me, across all of those documents. So in your application, check that spelling and check that grammar. Uh, ours is online, and I think there's a lot of temptation on those online application processes to use all caps, or we've also seen no caps. <laughs> Yeah, um, don't do that. Treat this just like it was a resume document. So check that grammar, check your capitalization, um, check that spelling, include all the information from your resume. So again, where you have customized this resume to fit this job, include that job experience in the description of your responsibilities for each of the jobs you've listed on your application. Tailor it to fit the job posting, tailor it to fit the job description and use their keywords um, in your application and in your resume. Also fill it in completely. We have had people submit, they just haven't filled it in at all, right? They don't even fill in the work experience section. It doesn't play well with the committees. As I said, some people are application people, some people are um, resume people. You don't know what they're going to look at. So, um, you know, make sure that everything matches, that everything is professionally constructed, it's completely filled out. All the attachments have been um, included. Um, and if you can upload attachments, for example, you can upload a cover letter or you can upload a resume. Our, our job website, and I would imagine most of them are the same, will let you preview what it looks like after you have uploaded it. Sometimes, and I don't know if it depends on which um, software you use to construct it, sometimes our uh, job website, our, our jobs website, changes um, sort of the structure or the format of your document when it uploads. So see what it looks like after it uploaded. Maybe you need to make a tweak to where the page breaks are or, um, you know, where the, the tabs and things are um, and upload it again. So just take a look at it. You can usually preview that. If it does not look right, pull it back off and, and upload another one, make some changes and upload it, but you can definitely preview them. And I would, I would double check everything before you submit it. So references. Not all references are created equal. Uh, the point of a reference is to pick someone whose opinion will be respected to recommend you for the job. So I've listed some examples of references that you can use going, in my opinion, down from the least useful at the top to the most useful references. So you can use people that you just know in your personal life, like family, friends. I would say this is the least useful kind of reference that you can use, right? Because they have not worked with you. A lot of people are one person at work and a different person in their real lives. And, you know, when an employer is calling to talk to your references, they want to know what kind of employee you were. Were you timely? Were you um, intuitive? Were you um, thorough in your work? You know, so they're going to ask those sort of, those sort of questions that your family and friends are obviously biased and, they can't answer for uh, for an employer. So I would say 
if you have nobody else, you can start there, but I would, I, I would not suggest that as your most useful reference type. You can also use coworkers, but I think for the same reason that you wouldn't really want to use personal friends, I probably wouldn't do coworkers either because the coworker perspective on your employment is going to be different from say the supervisor perspective, right? They don't have to manage you. They're just getting along with you, you know? And I think that's a very different kind of relationship. And so their opinion is going to have slightly less value to a prospective employer. You can do it. Um, but again, I think their relationship is different and, and they're not monitoring your work. They don't care if you turn up on time, you know? So um, again, it, you can do it, but I think it is not as helpful. Professors, I think, are useful, at least in terms of um, subject matter expertise. So if you're applying for something that requires an academic, an academic expertise, I think your professors, especially if you did research or you taught for them, um, can certainly have insight that would be valuable to an employer. Um, employees of the organization to which you're applying, I think, are a great reference. So if you know somebody within the organization, I think I think those are a great reference, especially if you know somebody within management as a, you know, as a potential uh, reference. There is always some danger with that, you know, because you don't know how well they're received within their within their company. But I think it's the, the benefit outweighs the danger of that. So I would suggest employees of the organization to which you're applying, if you know anyone who would be a good reference. Um, and then I have here at Starred your supervisor as the best possible reference, your past supervisors. I always consider it a red flag if we have a job applicant who is not able to list any past supervisors as a reference. Um, I find that very concerning. <laughs> you know, when you leave a job, you should absolutely not be burning bridges. You know, I want to be able to call those folks and see what kind of employee you were. Were you punctual? Um, were you creative in your problem solving? Were you effective? Were you competent? you know, all of those things. And the supervisor is the one whose opinion is really going to matter to me when I am, when I'm doing that. And I do, I do consider it a red flag if they are not on there. So I would definitely include at least one supervisor, multiple, if you can do it. All right. So let's move on to the interview itself. Successful interviewing takes work. It's, it's a real time commitment if you're going to do it right. The best candidates for a job did not just get up this morning and say, I think I'll go to a job interview today. Um, if you really want to nail that interview, you are definitely going to have to invest some time on the front end. So research that organization and research the job. You know, what do they do? Who do they do it for? What are their core values? You know, how big are they? Where is the job located? It kills me just a little bit, you know, when we interview for a county extension agent position and I ask a candidate, you know, what do you know about Estill County? And they say, not much really. And I think, but you want to live there? You want to work there? How do you know you're going to like it? You know, so definitely research that and be prepared to speak to that in your interview. Um, that information that you uncover, generally, you're not going to have to spout it back off like you're answering some kind of pop quiz, right? You're not just going to answer factual questions about them. You're going to take that interview research and let it help you focus your answers in the right direction. You want to be able to apply the right context to the answers that you're giving in the interview. So if you already know what they do and what's important to them, when you're giving examples from your own work history, you can focus on things that are going to be relevant to them, you know, so they can, again, see you in this job. Um, you know, so for example, if I were going to ask a, an extension agent candidate what kind of programming that they would want to bring to the county, them being able to say something like, I, don't know, I would introduce an adulting 101 class for high school youth because I can see they don't have one in this county and their county needs assessment, which I found online, shows that their youth are not adequately prepared for adult life is a much better answer than just randomly naming off a program because it tells me that you understand this job, you understand this county and you did your research. I have a couple of sources of information listed on there. Um, you can find out about potential employers by reviewing their company website. Uh, a lot of them have a Facebook account or a Twitter account, X. I'm sorry, I'm a little out of touch now, an X account. 
um, or corporate blogs. Um, and then there are also external sites like glassdoor.com that might have useful information about what is important to this organization and how they work so that you can help focus your answers on the experience and the skills that you have that are relevant to this specific job. You may do lots of things that are not as relevant. Let's focus on what is really important to them. I would research your interviewers too. Most companies will tell you who is going to sit on your interview panel. And I would say they are not selected casually for that role. They're typically selected to conduct an interview for a reason. So find out who they are, what is their role in the organization, because that's the perspective you're going to have to speak to in your interview responses. A lot of employers are moving to behavior-based interviewing. You should be ready for that and ready to answer questions under that style of interviewing. So you can Google behavior-based interviewing and see how those questions are structured. You can get some examples, but basically the interviewer wants you to give an example of a time when you personally faced a situation and how you specifically dealt with that situation. So your answer should be about things you have actually experienced and actions you have actually taken rather than just abstract answers about how you would do something if you were faced with it. So for example, uh, you know, to give you an example of a behavior-based interview question, you might get a question that says, tell me about a time when you had to juggle multiple projects simultaneously. That's a behavior-based question. Um, it wouldn't be, tell me how you stay organized. Right, because they're trying to find out how you have specifically handled this situation in the past. And it's typically going to mirror what you might expect to find in the job that you're applying for. I do think it's fair game to take your notes into the interview. Uh, interviews are not a test of your memorization skills and they are stressful <laughs> experiences. So um, make a list of, I would say, make a list of job assignments, work assignments that, or projects that you have done or you have worked on just to help jog your memory in the interview. I would not suggest, you know, memorizing a big long thing or memorizing um, answers to specific questions. I think just listing those work things that you have worked on can help you think quickly of a time when you dealt with an unreasonable customer. What was the situation? How do you handle it? If you're quickly looking through, you've got some things noted down, you can, you can provide a specific example from your past. Um, every single answer that you give during the interview needs to specifically answer the question why you are a good fit for this job. Even the answer to the dreaded tell me about yourself question. You know, when I ask, tell me about yourself, I do not want to hear about your memo. Um, I don't want to hear about your personal medical history. I don't want to hear that you wanted to go to vet school, but you failed whatever biology and so that crushed your dreams of vet school so now you're now you've studied something else and you're applying to my job because that makes me feel like your backup plan right I don't want to hear any of that stuff um so I, I would really like to hear specifically why you're a fit for this job so if you're for example applying for a job that is outside of your current field it's a new area to what you've done in the past then when you answer that tell me about yourself question um, talk about what relevant experience you do have, and then give examples of your adaptability, um, of your ability to successfully move into a new field or a new project. You know, focus your answer that way. Definitely come professionally attired. So um, what, I, what I mean there is invest in a nice suit. I think that's, um, that's an important investment. That is one that you will get a return on. Um, we have a lot of, you can't invest in a, in a new high quality suit. We have a lot of really great um, consignment stores in Lexington, and I'm sure in, in other areas, if you're joining us from someplace else, um, but that's a good investment for you. Again, everything that you're doing should be consistent with the message that you're a professional. So help them see you in that role and don't do anything that is going to distract from that message. I didn't put a slide up about this, but I do want to take a moment when, while we are talking about interviewing to talk about Zoom interviews, which I think have become a lot more prevalent since um, the beginning of quarantine. 
um, because that is a different style of interviewing. And I think it's, it's worth a mention. So some things, again, that might distract from a successful or take away from a successful Zoom interview, your headshot. So you can see here in my, if you can see it, um, my Zoom profile pops up my professional headshot. Um, and that is what appears. So make sure when you're popping up your picture is your professional one, um, that the name on your um, login is your name. <laughs> We've had people pop into an interview on somebody else's Zoom account and the name that comes up is not theirs. It is confusing. It is distracting. And I'm going to spend some time thinking about that when I should be listening to what you're saying. So um, make sure that the name is correct, that the name is yours. Um, the background. So we're in the middle right now of our intern interviews for next summer's intern program. And we were actually just talking yesterday about the lack of skulls in the background this year. We were a little disappointed in that. Um, we had a candidate last year who just, she didn't use a Zoom background. And I'm finding a lot of folks don't. Um, we're going to talk about that. Um, just had it facing her bookshelf and there's a skull sitting on the background. And I don't know what aesthetic she was going for there, but we also spent a lot of time like chatting amongst ourselves. Is that a skull? Do you think it's like a colleague, you know, in, in the background of, of her thing? It's distracting. Again, I'm going to spend some time thinking about that or responding to somebody else on the committee's text about that when I should be listening to what you're saying. So don't do anything that is going to take away from what you are trying to present to them. I would strongly suggest that you um, find and use, upload and use and test it ahead of time, a professional, non-distracting Zoom background. You could Google them. There are a lot of options out there. Um, you could Google and do like a conference room background or something that is not going to take away from what you're saying, that is not going to cause a lot of distraction to your interviewers. Um, but I probably wouldn't just do your kitchen in the background, even if you are interviewing at home for privacy at your dining room, your couch. You know, you want to be sitting someplace stable. You want to have your computer someplace stable. Again, nothing that is going to distract from your message. We once had an interview where we suspected and chatted about it because it's distracting that somebody was sitting on the floor <laughs> during their interview, really thought they might be, couldn't quite tell until the cat came walking through the room and climbed over them. And it was very obvious then that they were sitting on the floor for their interview. It just didn't scream professional to any of us. It was very strange. Um, speaking of which, your cats, your dogs, get those under control. Um, if you live in a neighborhood that has a lot of those pet sounds, think about reserving a room at the library. They have private meeting rooms at our libraries in Lexington where you could have good, stable internet access and a quiet space to do your interview and dress professionally. Um, wear the suit, jacket, and, and top at least, even though you're doing it on Zoom, I would still dress as though you were coming in person. So definitely continue to wear that suit and present that professional background and get good lighting. Um, don't sit in the dark and do, <laughs> and do your interview. We've had that happen as well. Again, very distracting. So that's my word about Zoom interviews. Um, manners are important. And so I, I think it is important still, even in this environment, to reach out and, um, and send a handwritten thank you note to every member of the interview committee right after the interview. That again, just reiterates that you're interested in the job, that you enjoyed that conversation, and that you welcome their consideration for the position. So handwritten thank you note, I would do it to each of the members. So moving on to fit. So if you are received job offers, I think it's important to consider a few things when you're considering whether to take them. Um, location is an important first one. So I think it's often overlooked, especially if you're desperate to, to move into a new role um, and you really just want the job search to be over. It's tempting to take something that's further away than you actually want it to be um, and, and then to potentially regret that later on. So Taking a job that requires you to commute has a lot of hidden costs. Um, for example, you know, again, I'm based in Lexington. Uh, there are a lot of job opportunities in Louisville, for example, but it takes one and a half hours to commute one way 
from um, Lexington to Louisville, especially during rush hour traffic. There's a lot of construction on that road. There's always accidents. It's not the biggest road. Um, so at an hour and a half, that's three hours of your day. Um, and again, longer in construction or during rush hour. You know, what are gas prices? Uh, it's harder to make that kind of commute profitable when gas is closer to $5 a gallon, which it has been during my career. Um, so sit down and actually do that math. You know, how much is it going to cost you to travel back and forth? Again, if you're talking Lexington to Louisville, that's 155 miles a day or 775 miles a week. So that's an oil change every three and a half to four weeks. That's wear and tear on the car. You know, if you're commuting again to Lexington, uh, from Lexington to Louisville, you're going to put 40,000 miles on your car each year. So you're going to have to replace that vehicle pretty quickly, which is a car payment, which is going to cost you several hundred dollars a month. So you have to factor those expenses in when you decide whether or not to take a job that is going to require you to commute. You know, a job offer is great and it's exciting, but it's no good if it costs you more to work there than it does to be patient and wait for the right offer. Um, I was actually once offered a judicial clerkship in Frankfurt, and those are not fancy paying jobs, but they're great, amazing experience. Um, they make you very, very employable in law firms because you have, you know, a good relationship with a local judge. You have inside knowledge on that court process, um, just uh, a broad legal background because of all the variety of cases that come through. So, I mean, law firms love to hire those judicial clerks, and I really, really, really wanted to take it. It was my first ever job interview. But when I sat down and did the math, I couldn't do it because I was basically going to be working for free or at my own expense. You know, I was not in a position to relocate at that time because of my husband's job. And we had a house with a mortgage that we were having to pay. And I had $60,000 in law school debt that was now going to have to start being paid back because I had graduated. So as much as I wanted to take that job for so many reasons, professional and just, again, to have the hunt over um, I couldn't take it. So it was my very first job offer and I turned it down and it was tough. Um, but that was the right decision. That was the right decision for me. Um, if you are going to relocate, you want to consider cost of living, which is not something I really had a grasp on when I first finished college. But I think this illustration puts it into perspective. Now it's a little old. My I could update my numbers, but um, it's been a while since I, I put this together. But at the time I pulled this together, which was just a couple of years ago, um, a 545 square foot apartment in New York represented by this shoe box um, would cost you about $3,000 a month. I'm sure it's more now with inflation. And at that same time, for $3,000 a month, you could get this what seems to be palatial estate in Lexington as a rental property so big you can see the shoe over here. Um, so cost of living really, really makes a difference. You know, there are websites that will help you assess cost of living in a prospective new city. So take advantage of those. They're going to tell you how much more or less your groceries, your housing, your utilities, your healthcare, and your transportation are going to be. So get on a couple of those sites and compare their assessments to get an idea of whether that amazing new salary in a new city is really that amazing. You know, Kansas City, Kansas, for example, has a surprisingly high cost of living compared to Lexington. So you know, get in there and take a look at that and really see if the, if the salary they're offering you makes sense for the market that you'd be living in. Benefits are also often overlooked um, by professionals, um, even seasoned professionals, but benefits can be worth actually 30% of your total compensation package. So you need to find out the value of your potential employer's contribution, for example, to medical coverage or to dental coverage, and then what your share of the premium is going to be. Um, you want to get information about their retirement plan contributions. Um, so definitely take a look at that because everything they're not paying in is something you're going to have to take out of your paycheck to pay for, which again takes down that take-home pay. So take a look at that. What is the value of those benefits? And I think it's fair game to ask for that information before you decide to accept an offer. And I think that's a great question to ask your interviewers, you know, about their, about their health insurance plans. Do they have a, you know, a summary that you can take a look at? What is the retirement plan? Are they going to match um, your retirement savings? You know, how are they going to do that? So, you know, I once worked for an employer that would match the first $250 of my retirement um, contributions, which is not very much. 
um, as opposed to the employer that I work for now that matches 200%. So they'll put in, if I put in five, they'll put in 10%. That's a much better return than I can even get on the market for my 5% investment. So, um, you know, that's important. As well as finding out when you become vested. You know, I think that's a fair question as well as you're reviewing those benefits. When do you become vested under their plan? Um, because if you're not going to be fully vested for six years, you're kind of stuck there for that six-year period. Um, because if you leave before you're vested, the employer contributions stay with the employer. You don't get to take those with you. So you've lost not only that dollar amount, but also the compound interest that could have been earned on it over time. So find out when those retirement contributions vest. I do see a question in the chat on how to pick the job. When would you negotiate salary and benefits? Um, I would negotiate that in the job offer process. I would typically um, do that towards the end of the process. So I think up to that point, you're assessing fit on a lot of different things. But I think when it comes down to it, that salary negotiation typically comes at the end. At least they do for us here. Um, take a look at the other benefits that they offer as well. Um, so like disability insurance, are they contributing to a life insurance um, or short-term disability? Do they have a long-term disability plan? How much vacation or sick days do they offer? Do they offer flexible value or flexible hours or hybrid um, work or tuition reimbursement? Um, there are a lot of different things in there that have a monetary value associated with them, and that's part of what they're paying you in. So it's important to figure out what is the value monetarily to you of these other things that they're contributing. Because again, everything that they don't contribute, you have to take out of your paycheck to pay for. Um, UK's tuition reimbursement, for example, is a great deal for us. My husband and I both work at the university. So um, we have children that could take advantage of the family education plan. So we can each get up to 50% you know, tuition waiver for undergraduate tuition for our children. So one child could actually go for free. That has a real monetary value to our family. So um, take a look at all of those things because that total benefits package, again, it has a big, has a big monetary value. You also want to take a look at opportunities for advancement. So um, I think it's always important to decide first where you're going, like where do you want to be in 10 years, what level of job do you want to have, what level of responsibility, what city do you want to live in, and then work backwards from there to the job that you need to take now. Um, so my first summer, uh, I clerked for a law firm at Bench and Brock. They were fantastic. Um, there was no Brock, so the only attorneys who worked there were Mr. and Mrs. Bunch and their two sons and their daughter-in-law at the time. I think it's a bigger firm now, but at the time. Um, and the point of clerking is to develop relationships in, in you know, local firms and hopefully get a job offer when you graduate. But I'm a Miller. I'm not a Brock. I'm sorry, I'm not a Bunch. So my chances of being hired in there were, were <laughs> at the time, less than none. Um, and it would have been really easy for me to stay there for a second summer. They wanted me to, and I really enjoyed working there. It's a good firm. But um, I needed to make a change because I needed a, a job offer at the end of law school. So I needed to, to continue to explore those options and find another place to get experience where I had the chance of moving into an actual regular position after I graduated. So think about where you want to end up and then work backwards to what you need to take now to get yourself there. In terms of corporate culture, um, you're gonna spend a lot of time each week at work. So you do need to make sure that it is a place you are going to fit in. And that's more than dress code. It's more than whether you get an office or a cubicle or you work hybrid or in person. You know, really consider that company's size and culture. Is it fast paced? Or is it laid back? You know, what is a typical work week like? You know, is there a lot of travel or night and weekend work? And do those things fit in with your home life and your personal obligations? So take a look at that. Those are questions to ask. All right. So that's kind of the end of that piece of it. But I do want to put in a plug for Cooperative Extension. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm the HR director for UK Cooperative Extension. And um, Cooperative Extension, if you are not familiar with it, it provides practical research-based education to help people and businesses and communities. 
Basically, we take the university to the people of Kentucky. Extension has an office in all 120 counties. So if you're wanting to work closer to family, you know, and you have family in another county in Kentucky, we could probably help make that happen. Um, so we employ people in all 120 counties, and those folks serve as a local resource to their communities. So um, you may not be familiar with the areas that Extension covers. I'm gonna go over a few. This is certainly not everything, but I think it's um, a, good, a good touch point for you. So agriculture and natural resources is one of the areas our agents work in. Um, they'll work with commercial scale farmers, backyard gardeners, outdoors people, anything in between, right? So we want folks to, um, to help them grow their food. We want them to understand the food system. We want to protect the environment and we want to become educated on the environment, um, all of those things. So that's what our agriculture and natural resources agents are doing. We also have family and consumer sciences agents. Uh, the focus of the family and consumer sciences agents is to provide research-based education on making healthy lifestyle choices, nurturing families, accessing nutritious food, empowering local leaders. They do a lot of things. It's a wealth of educational programming under their seven initiatives. And then 4-H youth development. So our 4-H agents will work with youth ages 5 through 18, and they're going to provide programming through school programs, through clubs, camps, conferences, um, and they're going to educate on citizenship and leadership and personal development and civic engagement and expressive arts and STEM and earth sciences and plant and animal sciences and healthy lifestyles and personal safety, just a lot of really high quality education for our youth. We have a website where you can see our careers. Um, I've got the job site uh, listed up here. It's ces-personnel.ca.uky.edu. If you come down to the careers link at the bottom, there'll be a job postings link at the bottom of the careers tab. So you can see that careers box there at the bottom. If you click on that and scroll down to the, next, the page it takes it to, you will have that job postings link. And that's all our current postings in extension. But you can also get on there and see the Extension County map. So if you're not super familiar with where all the counties are in Kentucky, um, all of our job postings list the county where the position is located in the job title. That is where the position is located. So um, get on there and take a look at that, see if that fits your needs. Um, we also have our job descriptions on there so you can see what it is uh, that we ask our, our staff, our biweekly staff and our Extension agents to do. Um, it also has our degree requirements. So for our extension agent positions, we do ask them to be subject matter experts in their fields. And so we have specific degree requirements for each of those. You can see those on the careers page and see what we're looking for there. And then um, if you are a current student or current graduate student, um, you could apply for our internship program as well. Um, as I said, we are currently open right now for applications until October 30th. Um, you apply for those on the UK Jobs website, um, and we're currently interviewing for those. So again, for current students um, uh, or current graduates, current undergraduate or graduate students, you can find more information about that internship program from that link, what it pays, what the expectations are, all of those things. So that's a summer position. Here's the list of degree requirements. This can be found on our personnel website, but you can see the 4-H Youth Development has the broadest of um, degree requirements. They, they'll take a lot more um, of broad backgrounds. Our agricultural and natural resources and family and consumer sciences um, positions are looking for degrees in the field, as well as our fine arts and horticulture agent positions, which I didn't mention, but we have um, in several counties. So, um, Again, if you're a current student or um, a current graduate student, we do have an internship opportunity. It is currently open right now, and you can get information on the personnel website um, and take this link in to apply. Uh, it is a 12-week internship. It generally runs from mid-May to mid-August. And so, again, we are currently hiring for that as well. It's a great internship. It's a professional internship. If you're a little bit closer to that, um, to that college experience, um, it's a great opportunity to get some professional uh, experience and some professional references, sorry. So here is our flyer for the internship experience. I'll stay here for a second if anybody wants to scan it. And that takes us to the end. Does anybody have any questions?
Thank you, Stacy, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you gave us a lot of great tips in terms of uh, casting that wide net out for your job search strategies. You're presenting a professional image, a lot of great resume and interviewing uh, strategies as well. We'd really appreciate all the wonderful information that you shared with us today. So if we do have questions, uh, please, anyone in the uh, in person here have a question for Stacy? Okay, anyone online have a question? All right, that must mean you did such a wonderful job, Stacy. at providing the great material here today. We appreciate, again, all of the wonderful tips that you uh, provided today. So thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, so we're gonna move into the closing of our program. And we want to uh, talk about who's hiring. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, there's, I don't think there was any employers here today in person. If there are any employers online, that want to share uh, information. And we see Krista is here. Oh, if I, can I, and let's see. You got it, okay. There are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, this is Krista Martin with Direct Employers Association. Um, we're a nonprofit member association built for and by employers. And we um, currently host the Kentucky State Job Bank, which is the Kentucky Career Center's Kentucky Career Portal uh, for searching uh, jobs, internships, apprenticeships, employers, labor market information, and more. Um, this is powered through the U.S. National Labor Exchange, which we co-host with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies. Uh, and so there's some great resources as well for veterans, virtual jobs, diversity, um, and of course, it's National Disability Employment Awareness Month, so happy NDEAM uh, to everybody. Um, I love our ability site um, that helps connect uh, qualified candidates with disabilities uh, with employment opportunities as well, um, and then any of our community partners um, or other employers in the area can connect with me to find out more about free resources uh, to improve positive employment outcomes and employer engagement for your folks. Um, so thank you to our member employers who take part in Job Club. We're a huge fan and any way we can be of service. All right, terrific. Thank you, Krista. Any other employers online that would like to share? Now remember, you can email your job club leads to jobclub at uky.edu by noon Eastern today, and we will make sure and include those in our post-meeting job lead list that goes out in our newsletter to our job club community. We do have a couple of leads I know that have come in this week. I think one came in this morning. Uh, so we'll definitely have those uh, that information available to you in that newsletter. Now, as... Uh, Stacy really did such a great job uh, covering uh, the 120 counties uh, across Kentucky with lots of great resources and programs for you uh, that are available to you for the uh, Cooperative Extension. Uh, we are located in Fayette County. Uh, the Extension Office is at 1140 Harry Sykes Way. And you can find all about its current programs at fayette.ca.uky.edu. So that information is there for you. Now we also have a UK Steps Temporary Employment coordinated by Nicole Waite, who is here in person, and she's gonna tell you about some opportunities for you there. Hello, everyone. Um, I am... Um, I have three jobs that I'm going to share with you today and then one program. But again, my name is Nicole Wade. I'm an employment specialist here at the University of Kentucky. Um, uh, STEPS is, a, for those who don't know, STEPS is a temporary, uh, is temporary employment, I should say, 
within human resources in the employment department. So we are a part of the university. We're not a different part of the university. It is a great way to get your foot in the door with the University of Kentucky, although it is a temporary position. Some of the positions do have the ability to transition into regular roles. One of the positions actually that I'm going to share today, which is a senior admin uh, administrative assistant position, I should say, at our graduate school. Uh, it is a full-time position, um, as I mentioned, with the ability to transition into a regular position. And uh, while in that steps position, there is some ability or flexibility with that schedule for part-time. Uh, there is actually an, a steps position with our extension center, also an admin position. Um, someone who's just looking for a little extra work, we have a weekend security position available. And then we have a new program. Um, we have a currently have a program that's been ongoing for the last couple of years with the College of Nursing and also with, through steps in nurse recruitment with medical assistance uh, with our college, uh, uh, Bluegrass Community and Technical College. We now have a Central Sterile Tech Career Program. And in this program, um, Students will be working 40 hours per week for 16 weeks online. And then that does include some in-person clinicals with UK Healthcare, uh, some shadowing in clinicals, I should say. So, and that is called Education Pipeline, uh, the Education Pipeline Program. So I will be sharing those links today um, so that they will be in that newsletter that'll go out to all uh, past and current attendees for Job Club. And of course, feel free to reach out to me if you have any direct questions. Thanks, bye. Great, great. Thanks, Nicole. Now, if you would like some more one-on-one -on -one help uh, with resume writing, LinkedIn review, uh, interviewing strategies, job search strategies, here at the UK Alumni Career Services, we are uh, happy to help you um, with some opportunities there, some one-on-one -on -one coaching services. So there's information in your packet on how to sign up for that. Uh, for those of you who are online, there's also a link to explore there with our services. Now, we are happy to announce our next job club will be November 14th on positive employability with our own Diana Doggett, who will be presenting that information. We so look forward to having her present that a topic to us on November the 14th. You can register at ukalumni.net forward slash job club or scan the QR code that is on your screen. We appreciate you all being here today, those of you online. Again, thank you, Stacy, for a wonderful presentation. For those of you who are in person, we will take some time to do some networking and uh, provide some more uh, help for you. So thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you next, next time.